Ben, nous allons euh, ouvrir cette séance. Euh, Aujourd'hui, c'est la première conférence qui est donnée euh, par euh, le professeur euh, Arato de la New School for euh, Social Research de, de New York. Le professeur euh, Arato s'est spécialisé depuis un certain nombre d'années dans euh, l'étude des transitions constitutionnelles et notamment euh, dans plusieurs euh, directions. Il a étudié de très près euh, le processus euh, d'Amérique du Sud. Il a étudié euh, le processus dans plusieurs euh, pays de l'Est et il a également euh, étudié euh, le cas irakien et il a publié un ouvrage qui a d'ailleurs pour titre « Constitution Making Under Occupation, The Politics of Imposed Revolution in Iraq » qui a été publié par Columbia euh, University euh, Press. Donc, euh, les conférences qu'il va nous présenter sont rassemblées sous le titre « Theory and Practice of Post-Sovereign Constituent Power » où il va à la fois euh, nous présenter le, les, les études sur des pays spécifiques qu'il a fait euh, sur ce, sur ce terrain-là et en même temps euh, une, essayer de formuler une théorie générale de cette, euh, de cette, euh, de cette transition. Euh, les séances auront lieu donc pendant quatre semaines consécutives à partir de ce, euh, de ce jeudi. Le professeur Arato euh, s'exprimera en anglais comme euh, c'est indiqué par le fait que les titres de ces conférences sont mentionnés en anglais, mais vous pouvez poser vos questions en, en français. Euh, il oui. comprendra cette langue, en tout cas pour comprendre euh, vos questions, même s'il répondra en, en anglais. And uh, of course, you can help me when I misunderstand okay, or okay, don't no understand problem. anything. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pierre, for inviting me. And I'm very grateful to the Collège de France for having made this uh, uh, possible. Uh, it's really quite exciting for me to be at this famous place. I'm a student of history, and so I even know how the place originated. Uh, uh, but uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, Uh, to uh, uh, lecture here before. So I'm, I am grateful, and I'm grateful for all of you who have uh, uh, come. I know really quite a lot of people here, and that's really nice, uh, uh, really good for me to uh, not only to know uh, people, but to know also that they will understand quite a lot of the things that I will speak about. So let me just launch into the, uh, the actual lecture, which I will... Uh, which I will read. As, as in the period 1989 to 1996, during the Central European and South African transitions to democracy, constitution creation is back on the international political agenda. In the wake of the Arab revolts in three countries, Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, constitution-making bodies are now being assembled after revolutionary overthrows of previous regimes, or at least incumbents. Here lies the decisive difference between then and now. With the exception of Romania, the Central European cases involved negotiated change within legal continuity, and the same was dramatically true in South Africa. The Arab revolts, on the contrary, broke legal continuity along with the laws of change of established regimes. We have experienced not only, a, not only large numbers of mobilized citizens active in transformations, that was also true in some Central European countries, but in two or three countries, the return of civil war as well. In Egypt, a veritable coup took place within the revolution. The return of revolution also means the reemergence of revolutionary forms of constitution making. While in 1990, only Romania had a classical European-type sovereign constituent assembly operating in tandem with a provisional government. It is now this combination that characterizes constitutional politics in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya. There is reason to expect that unless the electoral and coalition-forming rules and arithmetic are especially favorable, the historical dilemmas associated with this form will also return. Two outcomes, both unfavorable unfavorable for democracy and democratic legitim legitimacy thus become possible. The first one was feared by Lenin in 1905 when he warned that whoever holds the de facto physical power, in that case the Tsarist authorities, 
can control the outcome of the assembly's work. In Egypt, the candidate for such a de facto control is obviously the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, which has on its own formed the provisional government. The second negative outcome is constitution making by the bare majority of the assembly, imposing its product on the rest of the political forces. This is what Lenin feared in a very charitable interpretation, at least in 1918, when he went on to dissolve the Constituent Assembly. My four major theses in these four lectures will be the following. First, the combination of three modern concepts in the process of revolutionary constitution making, namely sovereignty, the fiction of the people, and the constituent power intensifies the already authoritarian propensity of revolutions, their elective affinity to dictatorship linked to ideas of total rupture, as well as the factual processes of civil war and internal coup. This I wish to argue today in context of the history of the two great democratic revolutions, their forms of constitution making, and the relevant forms of theoretical justification and self-reflection. Second, I wish to maintain that without openly or consciously abandoning the three concepts I just mentioned, a method of constitution making has emerged from Spain in 1977 to South Africa in 1990 to 1996 that has very much reduced the likelihood of authoritarian outcomes within and immediately after the constituent process. Beyond the alternative of reform and revolution, this new method that I will variously call post-sovereign after its principle and round table type after its main institution will be shown to be an, a synthesis of the French Constituent Assembly and the American Convention as understood since 1780 and 1787 at least. I believe that a theory of this new paradigm would have to break the link between popular sovereignty and constituent power. I will outline such a theory next time along with what I take to be its normative achievements. Third, I will however admit and analyze the path determined aspects of the new paradigm. Two weeks from today, I will use some contemporary social, social scientific analysis of constitution making to consider the reasons why modern constitutionalist constitutions are adopted, and beyond them, we'll try to show the close relationship of the new multi-stage process with such an outcome. I will try to draw out the normative implications of the best social scientific theories and attempt to show that in an expanded form, these, cover, these converge with the post-sovereign paradigm. Finally, in the last lecture, I will return to the path-determined dimension of paradigms and show that both a relatively balanced field of political forces and the failure, actual or potential, of reformist and revolutionary projects is needed to enter into the required political process. This path-determined aspect seems to vitiate the relevance of the new method wherever reform from above or revolution from below are politically possible. I will go on to show that the theoretical advantage that the post-sovereign paradigm is forced to solve the problem of legitimation through a plurality of means can be compensated, at least in principle, in reform and revolution, assuming full understanding of this problem. I will try to demonstrate this thesis in terms of the revolutionary processes currently underway in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, and the radical constitutional reforms of contemporary Turkey and Hungary. With respect to Hungary, I will explain, or will try to explain, how the post-sovereign paradigm itself went wrong and why the failure cannot be redeemed in the current project of illegitimate reform. So on to the first lecture. Legislator and popular sovereign. Democratic constitution making, the notion of revolutionary constituent power emerged first in the English revolutions of the 17th century. But even before Republican thought, and most importantly, Machiavelli anticipated its problems. Famously, the author of the Discorsi considered violent acts through extraordinary single lawgiver supported by civic religion, the only reliable way to found republics. It is strangely enough less well known that he also considered and decisively rejected fundamental lawmaking by an elected body of representatives. The relevant story to which he twice returns is the semi-mythological Livian one of the Decemviri, who according to tradition in 1452 or 1451 BC enacted the 12 tables, that the same tradition probably wrongly considered the basic or organic laws of the Republic. Following Livy, uh, what do you say in France? Live? Live. 
Leave it leave. It's the following, I will say, say it in English, which is also wrong, of course. Both French and English are equally wrong. Following Livius, Machiavelli considers this as the first and only episode of tyranny in the Roman Republic before Sulla and Caesar 400 years before. In particular, he contrasts the decemviri unfavorably with the classical dictatorship he resolutely defends, because while the dictator did not have legislative power, the ten had their very purpose in legislation. Moreover, unlike the dictator, they could be and were re-elected, and crucially, they had the plenitude of all power, legislative, judicial, and executive, we might say today, since the authority of all other offices and mag magistracies of Rome, including the popular assembly, was suspended. According to Mach Machiavelli, the decemviri could, and I'm quoting from the English, do everything the Roman people were competent to do, and it is by implication this substitution of the whole by a part that was the deepest source of tyranny as described by Livius during especially the second year of the 10 after the re-election of the body and its leader. Thus, what I will call sovereign constituent power was anticipated by Machiavelli and was rejected as such even as he did not yet possess the modern concept of sovereignty. It was otherwise with Rousseau. While he was in many things admittedly beholden to the Florentine, part of his assessment of the December episode is significantly different. Rousseau was unwilling to concede foundations to the undivided act of one individual and to inevitable violence. He repeats, to be sure, the claim that the December were tyrants and attributes the reason entirely originally for having, and I'm quoting from the English translation, united legislative authority and sovereign power in the same head. But he stresses a dimension not insisted on by Machiavelli. To the latter, the actions of the first decemvirate before the re-election proved only that tyrants could be beneficent or that they could use positive measures as a ruse to consolidate their power and to gain re-election. To Rousseau, on the contrary, and this is a long quote, the decemvirs themselves never claimed the right to pass any law merely on their own authority. Nothing we propose to you, they said to the people, can pass into law without your consent. Romans, be yourselves the authors of the laws which are to make you happy. He, therefore, who draws up the laws has or should have no right of legislation, and the people cannot, even if it wishes, deprive itself of this incommunicable right. End of the quote. I should note the obvious to the readers of Le Contrat Social, everybody here, in rehabilitating the idea of popular, sovereign, popular power, Rousseau has not entirely left the ancient lawgiver, the legislateur, figure behind. This is the meaning of the reference to legislative authority as distinguished from sovereign power. The need to distinguish authority and power accomplished by Machiavelli with the help of religion goes both ways. If the authoritative body assumes popular power, that is, when the December would no longer allow the comitia to meet and ratify their product, they became tyrants. But for the original acts of constitution, popular power is not enough. A lawgiver is still needed now in the guise of an expert, nonviolent, authoritative advisor. This is because Rousseau claims that while the general will is always right and tends to the public advantage, I'm quoting, it doesn't follow that the deliberations of the people are always equally correct. Our will is always for our own good, but we do not always see what that is. The people is never corrupted, but it is often deceived, and on such occasions, only does it seem to will what is bad. It's the English, unfortunately, but I think you're better off not hearing my French. The issue is deeper than the question of mere information and expertise, although they matter. Even with the problem of factions and partial wills, we do not reach the most fundamental problem. As in Machiavelli, the inevitable circularity of forming a free people where the people are not yet free must be still dealt with. It is still solved by Rousseau with the venerable figure of the legislateur. Yet it is on this point that both the authors of the Federalist and Sayez decisively break with him. They are proud to be able to do without the lawgivers and founders of the past. As Hannah Arendt argued, the Americans could rely on the authority of the already constituted small republics. But Sayez, she rightly claimed, indeed merged original power and authority in the same source in at least we might add a fictional source, not under any positive law, unlike the small republics in America. It is true, Sayez was a stand-in for Carl Schmitt in Arendt's analysis. Yet in the present context, by adding representation to the Rousseauian scheme, 
and denying the need for popular ratification by positing, the constituent, positing that the Constituent Assembly, I'm quoting from him, replaced the nation in its independence of all constitutional forms, Sayez did seem to return to the much criticized December model. Those who were even more Rousseauian than he in the Assemblée Constituant went further still. They had the authority of Rousseau on one important point at least. For the political philosopher too, all assemblies of the sovereign in an already constituted order fully possess what he did not yet call the constituent power and provisionally unite in themselves all powers in the state, including the governmental magistracy. To put it in modern terms, the amending power in Rousseau is not only a fully sovereign constituent one, but also has apparently no room for a separated executive, nor a need for either the expert counsel or the authority of a legislateur. This is the sovereign conception of constitution making, coupled with the idea of, of a provisional government. It was accepted by Sayez, the author of the Tiers Etat, at least in the main and most famous line of his argumentation. Dual revolutionary institutionalization of democracy. The sovereign conception, whatever its internal contradictions and vicious circles, was dominant in the French Revolution and played a role in the American as well. This is the last venue where I need to lecture on the problems of popular sovereignty in the French Revolution after the work of Fure, Baker, Olivier Beau, and Rosan Vallon. But I take from their work, as well as the great treatise of Raymond Curry de Malberg, and especially the essays of the late Claude Lefort, is that the institutionalization of the democratic idea in the revolution was double, indeed antinomic. The two positions could be stylized as Carrie de Malbrecht's popular versus national sovereignty, or better still, Lefort's revolutionary imaginary versus democratic regime. The former poll in both authors is represented by fictionally embodied versions of popular sovereignty, while the latter by the ban against all incarnation and the definition of democracy as the empty or empty place of symbolic power. One can see in Rosan Vallon's La Democratie in a Cheve, as well as in Edmund Morgan's Inventing the People, that neither of the polls could easily be made stable in the presence of the other. The attempt to give the fiction of the people a body, the pole of incarnation, whoever occupied or sought to embody it, was open to successive challenges by alternative, equally fictional claims, and no embodied representation of the people, whether the parliament or Cromwell's army, the legislature or the primary assemblies, the legal process or the insurrection could successfully or at least permanently justify its proud pronouncement to be the people itself, its own creator and regenerator. But the other pole of the antinomy is equally unstable. Next to the strong model of legitimation deceptively offered by the pole of sovereignty, the empty place or national sovereignty are primarily negative principles. They tell us what ought not be done if the myth of the one and usurpation are to be avoided, but not what should be done and by whose authority. For this reason, the search for legitimacy is opened, one that invariably seems to fall back into the pattern of attempting to incarnate the popular sovereign. The alternative of mere legitimacy or the sovereignty of the law seem in insufficient in a democratic age. Thus one poll, that of the empty place, is a reflexive one involving a critique of not only the repeated attempts at incarnation, but of the deeper idea of the people put in the place of the king. This is the cognitive advantage of what is also the liberal democratic poll. But the other, we should call it the populist poll, has great attractiveness to those who forget or never knew history. The oscillation between the two poles poses, of, poses the, an antinomy uh, uh, that seems to be the very fate and paradox of liberal democracy since its inception. Two interrelated quest, sets of questions emerge from this highly abstract consideration of revolutionary history. First, can the legitimacy problems of the liberal democratic pole, one to which we should gravitate, in my view, on cognitive grounds be solved? Can they be solved without appeal to popular sovereignty and the continual risk that agents from above and below will claim that they alone represent or even are the people? Can the fiction of the people be reconstituted as a partially counterfactual process of legitimation? Can we get beyond the alternative of revolutionary and merely representative <coughs> democracy 
These are some of the unsolved problems inherited from the French Revolution, and as I will try to show, even the American one, especially if you consider the history of the individual states. The two issues are connected because we need to understand legitimacy in broader terms than popular sovereignty if, if the oscillation, the dialectic of fictions, is to be brought to an end. In one period of French Revolution, figures like Condorcet sought to solve, solve the problem of the democratic antinomy by constitutional designs that incorporated direct and representative democracy in terms of a plurality of institutions and temporalities. All these projects failed. But even their authors barely realized with the brief and ultimate tentative exception of Condorcet in 1791, that the process of constitution making, the pouvoir constituant originaire, should itself be pluralized, beyond the dualism of a passive acceptance of a sovereign assemblage product and a referendum. The monism of the process was one of the reasons why the result, too, was always disappointing. The dominance of the theory of post-sovereign constituent power. On the European continent, at least, and wherever its revolutionary tradition has been influential, the dominant conception of, of the constituent power has been strongly marked by the embodiment pull of the democratic antinomy. In terms of concrete models, this has led to two options, sovereign constituent assemblies without ratification and sovereign assemblies followed by referenda. But as Carl Schmitt, the, the most famous advocate, claimed with the authority of Siez uh, behind him, other organizational forms would be equally possible. The indeterminacy follows from the imputed fictional subject of the process. Following one trend in the Sayez of Tirs Etat, this subject is defined as the people or the nation that pre-exists all organizational and constitutional forms and cannot be bound or limited by them. It is said to be in the state of nature, but apparently not of individuals, but of peoples. Already Sayez argued that the representative body of this constituent power, its carrier or Traeger, in the words of Schmidt, is as unlimited and unlimitable by any constitution as the sovereign people itself. It can do all the nation can do, as in Machiavelli's depiction of the Decemviri. Such an, organ, such an unorganized but sovereign entity can not only create the constitution it wishes, but it alone disposes, free of prior rules, the process of its own creation. The maximally democratic claim can, however, uh, claim has, however, an elective affinity to dictatorship. Before a constitution is, enact, is enacted, in the rupture between two constitutions, the, car the carrier or representative cannot rule according to the old or in the new rules. Since arbitrary rule is supposed to be bound by substantive and temporal limits of the making of the new constitution, this is a form of dictatorship rather than tyranny or despotism, even if the terms were often, as in the French Revolution, interchangeably used. But the constituent power or its representative's dictatorship is not the Roman or commissarial type, but what Schmidt called a new form of new form sovereign dictatorship. It is rooted politically in the logic of revolutionary rupture and theoretically in the model of embodiment, are you called it emanation, with its enormous gulf between imagined and empirical people. The constituent power makes its constitution in, in the name of the imagined one, excluding from the process and even citizenship large parts of the population, large parts of the empirical population. This, of course, leads to constitutions of the majority at best, and usually the minority that holds power or, ha or has managed to become politically mobilized. It thus almost inevit inevitably leads to charges of usurpation and competing claims of alternative popular sovereignty, electoral or insurrectionary. Political repression and authoritarian rule are the only answer if these two types of claims are to be neutralized. Thereby, the two terms, popular and sovereignty, come apart. Dictatorship in the name of sovereignty cuts off the quest for duality or multiplicity of power inherent in claims of embodying the people. While the assembly's dictatorship may be a theoretical one, its authoritarian consequences are often enough empirical. Interestingly, until recently, no attempt has been made to fully work out and to propagate the theory of an alternative form closer to the other pole of the democratic antinomy. The American experience paradoxically provided early clues, but also a dead end for those seeking an alternative to French models. American exception, federalism or dual power. I do believe that not only the prestige of French revolutionary forms, but also satisfaction with the supposedly superior 
but never critically examined American model. They're parts of the reason why the alternative democratic conception remained undeveloped. The first problem was that the difference between the practice and theory or theories of the American model or models after 1780 was difficult to notice or identify. Even the making of the federal constitution that followed Massachusetts and New York and New Hampshire forerunners could not help very much. Madison probably helped to confuse analysis when in two parts of the Federalist, he represented this process in two different ways, one implying the making of a treaty by legally seceding states in Federalist 40, and the other coming closer to a multi-stage model but involving illegality. Crucially, neither picture abandons alternative and, alternative and incompatible concept of sovereignty, but each was incomplete. Madison could not yet write at the time that the process was to have another stage on the demand of the Anti-Federalists, the passing of the Bill of Rights, formally through constitutional amendments, whose status was and is surely original. But nowhere does he stress, as he might have, that in contradiction to the history of nine states earlier, ordinary legislatures remained fully in power during the making of the federal constitution, both for the Federation and the units, and that both the Philadelphia Convention and the ratifying conventions were restricted to the constitutional task alone. Thus, the double differentiation of the federal process was not clearly posited, even though the idea that the convention <coughs> could only recommend did have the implication that the same body could not legislate. As a result, the relationship of double differentiation to the possible dangers of what eventually was called dual power, 20th century, could also not be faced. Indeed, the relationship between the doubling of assemblies and the problem of sovereignty was also left unexamined. Yet the danger of attempts to embody the sovereign were not only relevant to radical revolutionary transformations such as that of France, and the eventual appearance of dual power even in America is proof. In spite of Hannah Arendt's claim, a strong notion of popular sovereignty was not absent among the theorists of the American Revolution, both Federalists and Anti-Federalists, playing a role both for the theory of judicial review and for many of the popular insurrections of the time. Almost as intense as in France, there was a struggle between those who claimed that the elective representatives speak for the sovereign and that the sovereign's constitution can be changed only by its own rules, and those who claimed, on the contrary, that only popular movements and initiatives, forms of practice ranging from insurrection and public surveillance to popular constitution making, bound by no legal rules, could incarnate the people. But the issue was contested mainly in the states, the seats of most of the power at this time. And most importantly, it was filtered and stabilized by a divide more fundamental in America between claims of sovereignty of the emerging national state and those of the states, the units. Popular sovereignty was not so much absent as itself antinomic and thereby represented not only by constitutional structures by, but, but by the very conflicts that short-circuited the dialectic of the fictional form. At issue is not only the role of federalism in weakening the abstract and indeed fictional concept of popular sovereignty, but the design problems of the constituent process. With the help of, practice, of the practice, federalism, some of the possibly destructive consequences of popular sovereignty, part of the theory, were significantly reduced. The federal or, indeed, or initially confederal nature of the polity had a double role in producing and stabilizing the dominant, doubly differentiated American model. Interpreted as a treaty in its origins, the federal, revolution, the federal constitution had to be agreed upon by the states as provided for in newly elected conventions. Yet if more coherence and integration than in the Articles of Confederation was desired, something the individual states could not accomplish, for this, a unified, some kind of unified body, a drafting convention later, later called federal, was available. Conversely, interpreted as constitution from its origins, and not just a treaty, and not just in enacting the Bill of Rights, its main agent did not have the power in the confederal system either to assume a plenitude of all powers or to impose its product. A separate scheme of ratification was needed relying on the states, since a common referendum also could not be imposed or enforced, although it was actually suggested. From this perspective, the violations of the previous treaty 
uh, like rule of revision were real, but these irregular steps were as far as the federal convention could go in the face of internal opposition and external power. From a French point of view, the coexistence of the convention and Congress could seem like a doubling of sovereignty, but this dual power was in fact on a stable and untouched foundations of a third, something you stressed, the importance of a third, the, po the powers of the state legislatures. It was they who delegated the members of the convention who were not freely elected. Would things work the same way for a unitary state? There is also an American test here, the level of the states that from a constitutional point of view were unitary. Here, the already mentioned case of Pennsylvania in 1776 showed the instability of the doubly differentiated mode. While a separate convention was then elected for the purpose of constitution making alone, this body assumed all powers in the state and marginalized, actually suspended the standing legislature. The story of this process eerily resembles and, in, and indeed anticipates the constituent assembly model, not only in France, but also in countries later on like Venezuela, recently, but the constitution it produced also anticipates the radical democratic character and complexity of French proposals of the year 1793. Moreover, its complexity and amending difficulties led to a struggle for a new convention that in the end, in 1790, again in Pennsylvania, was established extra-legally. More important here is the point that double power did emerge and was put down by the greater force, each time actually both in 1776 and 1790. <coughs> this happened where the social composition and ideologies of the two assemblies were too different, and importantly, at a time of full revolutionary upheaval before even formal powers of the Confederation were agreed upon or enacted. That illegal but arguably legitimate assumption of powers in the states would not work in a federation with real powers was found out much later in Rhode Island during the so-called Doors Rebellion of 1841 to 42. Here the amended colonial constitution survived well into the 19th century and there were excellent reasons for calling a convention to produce a new one. This the elected legislatures could or would not know the important phenomenon of freezing obviously played a role. Thus a people's convention was organized illegally but supported by a referendum thus with a high degree of legitimacy. Dual power indeed emerged and there was a small civil war in the state. Throughout the crisis, the federal authorities supported the official legislature and the popular project lost at least immediately. Even the Supreme Court upheld the winners and the martial law they imposed in Luther v. Borden in 1849. The Rhode Island conflict is instructive. I mean, it's the smallest state imaginable, yet the conflict is instructive for several reasons. It shows the affinity of American notions of popular sovereignty with its antinomies to dual power and that it is difficult to contain it through double differentiation. Indeed, double differentiation can be the prelude to its intensification, especially with organized assemblies having full electoral legitimacy on both sides. And it shows that the danger of dual power avoided in 1787 by the existence of the states could also be neutralized the other way around when it appeared in a more virulent form in a state through the existence of a federal union. These two lessons, however, both of federalism, put a question mark next to the model of double differentiation when linked to a strong concept of popular sovereignty and, conf and confirms the suspicion then in unitary or less balanced federal states, this American model may be precarious. The idea of exceptionalism, exceptionalism is thereby confirmed, if only partially. This does, does not mean, however, that we should thereby affirm the unavoidable role of sovereign constituent assemblies in radical transformation. Sayez, Condorcet, and the idea of a provisional constitution. We still have the option of both de-emphasizing the sovereign people in the constituent process without surrendering democracy and finding an appropriate constitution-making method or methods that will realize this objective. I return to Sayez. Here, of course, I can rely again on the contemporary work of, of the authors of the Critical Dictionary of the French Revolution, as well as Pasquale Pasquino's book, Lucien Jean, Baud, Olivier Baud, and Rosa Malone. Aside from the theory of the sovereign constituent power he's best known for, and the one Carl Schmitt developed in the 20th century, 
Say yes, had as Pasquino and others have shown, a liberal side as well. Interpreters as Egon Zweig and Curry de Malberg have stressed the Montesquieuian influence on the theory of the pouvoir constituant that must be seen in tension with the undeniable role of le contrat social. There is little doubt about the liberal stress of, of Sayez's post-Termidor speeches, even if the famous jury was probably an idea taken from radical democratic American sources that have earlier influenced Condorcet as well. Today, I want to maintain that all the various interpretations have strong textual support, and therefore Sayez must be seen as antinomic from the start. His antinomy is the same as that of the democratic revolution itself, popular organ versus national state sovereignty, populism versus democracy. And this antinomy doesn't simply map into the distinction of constituant versus constitué, but penetrates the idea of the constituent power as well as the organizational schemes attached to it. With respect to the organization of the constituent power, what I will argue is that Sayez also held an American position based on the late American practice at the very moment when he developed the alternative, characteristically French, monistic one concerning the ultimate nature of this power. Moreover, under the heading of what ought to have been done in tiers etat, he depicted the double differentiated extraordinary constitutional convention, specially elected for the purpose of constitution making alone, as the fundamentally right approach on the level of principles. This idea was then subsequently repeated more clearly than before in apparent contradiction with that of the lack of limitation in a famous text of 1789 summer. But Sayez held the American theory in an antinomic structure of thought, divided between the question of the power and its organization, as well as between ought and is, the power of norms and that of factual constraints. These factual constraints, necessity on the obvious level, had to do with the logic and demands of a radical revolution. While it would have been desirable to convoke and elect an extraordinary representation charged with the constituent function alone, this did and perhaps could not happen, and the task devolved on the Estates General, Etat Généraux, or its third estate. It was not desirable but defensible nonetheless that the National Assembly, Assemblée Nationale, so formed should assume also other functions. While there were two ways to get to the des desired object, a new constitution, it was better to follow the less desirable of the two of these than to abandon the task altogether. On a deeper sociological level, the issue had to do with one fundamental difference everyone knows between France and America, the difference between an absolutist state linked to orders and estates, and the proto-republican organization of the polity, what Condorcet, speaking for his radical contemporaries, was to express as the important difference between the revolutionary transition from despotism to a free constitution and the transition from a free constitution to a more free one. The first, where people are recovering their rights against what he called despotic usurpation, cannot avoid revolutionary turmoil, cannot presumably follow the same forms as the second. But in, but in 1791, when the new legislative assembly was about to be elected, when others called for a second convention, again with the plenitude of all powers, he now maintained that it was time to separate the legislative and constituent forms of power instead. So yes, represented an even more complex case. While the word sovereignty may have been largely but incompletely absent from his work till the partially self-critical polemic against unlimited power in the year three, in 1789-1791, minus, I don't know how many years, right? Minus three, minus two, the constituent power in the state of nature without any limitations except the most self-chosen and self-enforced one was also fundamental for him. If the constituent power was a replacement for the term sovereignty, as Pasquino argued, it was an incomplete and ambiguous replacement. At most, it revealed a difference with le contrat social, a consequence of having turned to representation that involved the protection of the Constitution against the legislative power itself, something that could not be possible or even necessary for Rousseau. But this would have led only to single differentiation. In other words, the legislative power must be kept from the constituant. Possibly because of the influence of Montesquieu, Sayez, however, adopted American double differentiation, clearly as a more secure way to stop representatives from abusing their power, the power of incumbency. 
This, however, did not lead to a full break with Rousseau as far as the constituent power went. To the extent that now a representative organ was set again, I'm repeating this phrase, to replace the nation in its independence of all constitutional forms, with its will having the same worth, as he says, as that of the nation itself, it was thus itself unlimited and, unli and unlimitable. Admittedly, legislative power, a key dimension of sovereignty, was assigned to constituent power or its organ only under the pressure of necessity. This would imply a limitation if it was clear how such a functional differenti differentiation could be enforced against a more recently elected constitution-making body. Say yes doesn't provide an answer, and the process of 1792-93, when the survival of the legislative assembly was never a serious possibility, as I learned from Arnaud Le Pilier, Pilier illustrates the difficulty. The beyond, beyond the antinomy, however, there was also a third say yes. He did not, in 1789, simply register the impossibility of following the most desirable American road. While often seen as the champion of this, necess this necessity, as the new desirable, this is wrong for Sayez. Not only did he not abandon the norm, held admittedly in an antinomic tension, but he went on to propose a new scheme for realizing it. In two texts, at least, he proposed treating the work of the Assemblée Constituante, the Constitution of 1791, in effect, as provisional, that would have to be confirmed as definitive by a new assembly or convention properly elected for that purpose. He nowhere implies that the new body would have the power only to say yes or no, and he definitely does not mean a referendum by either the primary assemblies or by the atomized population. Condorcet recorded his partial assent in 1791, and even completed the argument. From first affirming the American doubly differentiated model as the paradigm for the amending power, he imperceptibly moved on, as did Sayez, to a new and different idea applicable to the process of constitution making in which they still found themselves. It would be useful, Condorcet argued in early August 1791, to, the, to consider the constitution then on the verge of being fully enacted to be provisional <coughs> until a new convention after discussion would ratify it. If a ratificatory referendum he otherwise considered justified, he's different than Sayez on this point, would not take place, he thought a second convention would be all the more important, one doubly differentiated, being able to combine popular participation with wise deliberation, existing side by side with the legislative assembly, both under the provisional constitution, a new convention was meant to review and revise. This is the first time with Sayez and Condorcet, that the important idea of the provisional or interim constitution made its appearance in constitutional thought. Confronted with the problem of inevitably imperfect beginnings, this idea was to have an important career from Sayez to our century, in France, Germany, and Japan first, and then from Spain to South Africa and beyond. Olivier Beau has rightly called our attention to the pre-constitution or little constitution in 1945 to 46 in France. Validated by a referendum, this sketchy document was, however, no longer revocable, as Le Pilouet shows, uh, by the constituent assemblies under it. This shows an element of significant innovation not to be neglected, the first sign of the emergence of what I call a new post sovereign procedure. To the early efforts in France, at most, one can apply a notion like Schmidt's minimal constitution, but that construct in his work cannot reliably bind a provisional government and a freely elected constituent assembly. Sayez, on the other hand, speaks about self-imposed limitations without making clear if they can be binding or not. On the other hand, his idea of a provisional constitution proposed because of the flaws of the formation of the constituent assembly is different than Schmidt's notion of a minimal constitution uh, to which a sovereign constituent power submits itself voluntarily and which it can invalidate on its own. For Sayez and Condorcet, the provisional constitution not, is not simply self-imposed by the sovereign organ or the provisional government that remain in place and in control of the process. Admittedly, Sayez excluded negotiations as a way of starting the process that would thus preserve its initially imposed character. But the results would apply to new organs that replace the old, and thus it can be said to be an attempt at a constitutional redefinition of the process, binding the other rather than binding the self. <clears throat> 
In Condorcet's version, the first constitution would be external to the second assembly, would remain in effect during its deliberations, and bind it as well as all other actors till the enactment of the second constitution. All this follows clearly from his notion of convention as ultimately a type of amendment procedure, however total it may be. For him, the subjection of even the popular sovereign to law was central, and that is what allowed the full separation of a constituent function. Admittedly, Sayez didn't say quite as much, and perhaps his antinomic conception didn't allow him to say it. But it follows from one of the two things he wished to achieve, aside from proper elections by the two-stage model, namely double differentiation. The later would be possible only if enforced under the first, the interim constitution that has already made France, in Condorcet's words, a free country. This line of reasoning points beyond Oregon sovereignty, a conclusion Sayez was to explicitly draw in his speech of the year three. As I will show in my next lecture, introducing the post-sovereign conception, that, results, that result could be attained where double differentiation was not fully possible or deemed unstable. New elections, of course, very much matter to Sayez. If a body with less than full democratic or electoral credentials created the Constitution, its work has to be taken seriously, but it must be open to full revision if it is to become legitimate. On this point, as on so much else, he was anticipated by Americans, as he may have known. At the Federal Convention, first Edmund Randolph and then George Mason expressed their willingness to sign the Constitution only if it were not final and involved calling a second convention. They were disturbed by the fact that the ratifying conventions had only a passive role, being able to say yes or no, thus leaving the real drafting work to an unelected body, the Federal Convention itself. I'm quoting from Randolph, a second convention will know more of the sense of the people and be able to provide a system more consonant to it. It was impo imp improper to say to the people, take this or nothing, end of quote. Randolph here focused on the fatal flaw of all referenda that, by the way, even Condorcet never seemed to have fully noticed. But the idea of a second convention, also demanded by various anti-federalists, anticipated the proposal of Sayez. Given his link to Jefferson, the patron of these Virginians, we can certainly assume this concept influenced the thinking of Condorcet. With his theory of complex democracy, what really tied him to an American like Mason, were ideas of active participation by different bodies. This idea was more guided by 18th century American practice than by the theory of the framers of the federal constitution, a theory that was no less antinomic than French conceptions of the time. Actually, it was more antinomic. In America, uh, the conception led to the Bill of Rights, drafted not by a second convention, but by the new amending power under the Constitution. That would have made little difference to Condorcet, since he did not really distinguish the amending from the original constituent power. But in his case, unfortunately, the result was only an, an elegant, a very elegant constitutional proposal that went nowhere. The same was indeed true of the idea of a provisional constitution first articulated by Sayez. Paradoxically, it, was, it, it is easy to lose the real power of his proposal because of his legitimate focus on elections. The problem was more general, however, than even Sayez might have thought. Free elections do not happen by themselves. While this, is a supposedly, while this is supposedly less of a dilemma where there are constitutions and electoral systems already in place, and even there it's a problem, elsewhere it is provisional governments that hold the key and can structure the form of elections. Thus, I repeat, if the proposal reduces to free elections to a convention or constituent assembly, its full power is lost. Free elections cannot solve the problem of how to begin. Let me conclude. There is an, there is an alternative to the answer of cutting through the vicious circle uh, by concentrated powers of sovereignty. The disregard of suggestions in France by Sayez and Condorcet, as well as the somewhat more influential proposals of Randolph and Mason in America about a genuinely two-stage drafting process, were important clues about how this could be developed, especially without the stabilizing conditions of America itself. Yet there had to be not only other institutional innovations, but also a fundamentally transformed attitude to the modality of change, namely revolution, 
for this conception of, of a multiplicity of stages, provisionality, and implicitly a set of different constituent actors, none of them sovereign, uh, to reappear in new guises. With respect to Sayez, it was ultimately not only the dogma of sovereignty, interpreted in terms of organs, but the spirit of revolution that dictated which side of his antinomic theory would be influential, not only in the midst of the dramatic events of the revolution itself, but in the subsequent almost 200 years with the undiminished prestige of revolutionary change. It took a revolt against the spirit of revolution for the post-sovereign conception to really come into its own. Thank you very much. Thank you.